So good morning and welcome to our fifth Sunday Chai and Why. On a fifth Sunday, we take uh, you for laboratory of TIFR and today we are in the X-ray dissection laboratory of TIFR and we have Mr. Mahesh Gokhale with us and uh, a student, Manisha, and they are going to discuss about what X-ray dissection is and all about uh, X-ray. So Mahesh, all you. Good morning and uh, we'll start with our experiment here. This is a TIFR X-ray diffraction, uh, diffraction lab. So all you are all welcome to see the experiment we are going to conduct in next few minutes. So first we'll see what is the X-ray diffraction, how we are using it for our experiment. So, Mahesha, what is can you explain us what the X-ray are? Yes. So, like, you know the radiation, the light... light Okay, so you know that light is uh, electromagnetic radiation and there is a characteristic of light that is a wavelength. Now visible light is between 300 nanometer to 780 nanometer, but below this 300 nanometer and above this 780 nanometer, there is a full radiation spectrum, which is ultraviolet, UV, uh, infrared and all kind of electromagnetic radiation. So what we see is because of the visible light. What happens is that the visible light will reflect from the object. It will go to our eyes and we, we see that object. Similarly, the X-ray radiation, which is consists of very small wavelength, which is around uh, order of nanometers, we can use that for uh, looking different objects. So, so you said they are of very high energy. Yes. So is it to say Yes. Entering this lab without wearing a proper sheet. Yes, this is said because whatever X-ray we are generating in this lab, these are generated with a special treatment and it is covered, it is enclosed. So there is no radiation coming out of the uh, diffractometer. This, whatever the radiation we are using is measured outside the outside the diffractometer with some uh, uni with some measure me measuring instrument. And every year it is checked that it is safe. So this radiation is something like less than uh, 2.5 microsievert per hour per square centimeter, that kind of a standard thing, which is uh, made by the manufacturer and it is declared and it is regularly checked. So it is very safe to come into this lab. Well, so, what part do we use uh, generally? X-rays, you know that uh, when you go for some uh, uh, medical X-ray, that is if the bone is bro broken, they ask us uh, ask you to go for a uh, x-ray treatment so that they will get your x-ray of the broken bone and from that you know that there is something in uh, something is broken so what happens is that these x-rays which are of the energy uh, like 10 kilo electron volt or more that passes through uh, your uh, tissues but it will be obstructed by your bones and if there is a crack then you know that uh, it, they, it will give an image now that energy is somewhat larger than the X-rays which you are using in this lab. Okay, so why do we actually use the X-rays here? Why do we use it? Yes, because the visible light has a wavelength of 300, uh, 300 uh, nanometer to uh, 7, uh, sorry, 780 nanometer. We cannot use that for looking the atomic arrangements in the matter around us, like crystals, uh, amorphous material, and other things. So we need a wavelength which is comparable to this atomic spacing. So, you know that whatever material around us, you can distinguish between two parts. One is amorphous and other is crystalline. So, what is amorphous material? Like material like glass, you know that glass is around us. So, this is amorphous kind of a material. So, in which there is no definite arrangement of atoms. Like these atoms are not arranged in any fashion. They are, they are randomly arranged. So, this a particular class is called amorphous material and glass is very simple example of that. Now the crystalline part. Crystalline material is like salt, sugar, the diamond. Most of the materials which we see around us are in the crystalline form. 
the quartz crystal used in our digital clock is also a very good example of crystal so you know that there are crystal can be uh, like very dark scale from the microscopic point of view you see this uh, gypsum crystals which are uh, very large in meters of size the man is standing there and you can see that from the large scale to small scale this is na india marsan and nanowire grown in our lab which is of the order of few nanometers in scale now the crystals used in the electronics industry is mostly uh, it is mostly from the silicon crystal or sapphire crystal and which are very big these crystals are like uh, few meters in the length which is grown and the weight is around like 240 kg or kind of that now using this big crystal it is cut into small sizes this is called wafer on that wafer we use our uh, these different uh, different procedures to make electronic devices so this is one of the example that on the sapphire substrate which is cut from the big crystal of the sapphire there is indium nitride this one sapphire and there is indium nitride uh, material this is sapphire and indium nitride is grown on that which is of the order of like 0.5 micron or so so are all crystals the same no they uh, you can uh, distinguish between uh, uh, several crystals so but any crystal in the universe you can uh, it will be from one of the seven families you can start with simple cubic crystal where the atoms are at eight corners of the crystal of the cube now if you stretch this cube or if you twist this cube you can generate many different systems these are called crystal systems now any crystal in the universe can be one of these seven uh, crystal systems so So, how do X-ray help us to distinguish all these crystals? Yes. How does now, X-ray help us? Now, since we have seen that the visible light cannot be used for uh, looking at this crystal uh, atomic arrangement, what we need, how we see, we we have to use a technique called diffraction. Diffraction is technique uh, where the we are using the wavelength property or the wave nature of the radiation. So, what happens in diffraction? If you see this example of uh, DVD. if you tilt it around you will see some light uh, some colors are generated now this dvd is having grooves made on that in order to uh, store data on that so this grooves are of the order of 700 uh, nanometer which is very uh, like similar to the uh, wavelength of our visible light so what happens is that because of this grooves when light falls on that there is a there is a phenomena called diffraction so that at particular angle which you will see in uh, our next slide at particular angle this uh, there is a interference of this uh, uh, visible light and it will get diffracted where we see the different color now because of the uh, wavelength is different for different colors like blue to red so there the diffraction angle is different and because of this tilting you see the different color whereas the atomic arrangement is atomic spacing is around the order of nanometer so we have to use x rays because they are their wavelength is like few nanometer which is very similar to interatomic spacing we use this technique for diffraction for study uh, for analyzing the crystal structure so atomic arrangements in crystal atomic arrangement in crystal okay. so similarly now how to use uh, x rays for amorphous material so that we will see with another technique which is called x ray refractivity so that we will see in the next so how are they actually generated how do we generate x ray okay. are we it's, using this kind of radiation no radiation? we are we are not using any kind of radiation we are using simple technique like a thermonic emission to generate electrons these are accelerated by high voltage uh, plate and this x rays these uh, electrons which are uh, which are accelerated by high voltage plate they will strike on particular material like molybdenum copper uh, uh, silver those kind of things now when this uh, high high uh, accelerated electrons are uh, like uh, like uh, colliding on the material they will remove the electrons uh, they will generate the x rays from this particular material which are called characteristic x rays for copper it will generate x rays for the wavelength uh, 0.15 nanometer or so, so are we using copper we are using copper target here we can use different target so depending upon target you can select the wavelength so i will show you like how we generate this 
and how you how we detect also so we'll go to the uh, x ray diffractometer and see this So this is a X-ray tube, X-ray in which uh, we can generate the X-ray. So there is a target at this end where this copper target is placed. Then there is the electrical cable which is coming here. It will it will have that uh, high voltage plates and it will uh, there is a uh, tungsten filament. And this is for cooling arrangement. This target will be cooled by using water. So this is the X-ray uh, X-ray generation tube. Okay. okay. And the X-ray which are generated are coming from this window. This is particularly I have to cover this window. And this X-ray will be coming from this window. So the copper target is inside this. Window. Yeah, here at this end, copper this target end. is there. The electron, the filaments and other things are here. So the filament will uh, this X-ray uh, Electrons will go and strike on the copper target there. And then the X-ray will come out. X-rays will come out from this. Oh, yes, target is here. X-rays will come out from this. X-rays are coming out from all other other places. This is a window made specially for focusing on the sample okay. which we are mounting there. Okay. What is the size of this tube? Size of the tube. Uh, okay, wattage. Wattage is something like two kilowatt. Okay. It is uh, not very big, like a medical X-ray, which is uh, having more uh, power. But this is used for X-ray diffraction purpose in the laboratory. Yes. Okay. So I will show you the diffractometer. This is the this is the diffractometer where you can see that we mount sample at the center. There is a X-ray uh, tube which is generating X-ray, which is here. This X-ray beam will come, and there is a beam conditioner which will narrow down the beam. It will fall on the sample, and there is a detector here. So this detector, when there is a diffraction, the intensity, X-ray intensity, diffracted intensity, will be collected in this uh, in this detector, and we'll get the X-ray peak. Okay, so we'll show you this with one example. Now, when I, what happens is that I will show you with one example. Now, first we'll take amorphous sample. This is a quartz. Uh, this is a glass. Uh, so glass is crushed and may, like a powder is made. So we'll see that if anything, uh, any any peaks are coming from this. Okay, so first we are checking amorphous sample and then we'll see a crystalline sample. So it is mounted like this. You see the arrangement. So when we start the X-ray diffractometer, the source, this X-ray tube will go like this direction upward, this way. Okay. The detector will move upward like this, and there will be angle, which is a two theta, which is going down this way and this. So, so this will make, uh, this, both of them can go up to 90, less than 90. So this will come closer now. When they go up, okay. it will come closer. So when we take a scan, I will show at the end of the scan, I will show what is the situation. So I will close this door. Now this is enclosed in such a way that no radiation can come outside. Okay. So we can start. So on the display, there are three things are shown. One is the X-ray, uh, the voltage, which is that uh, uh, electrons are accelerated by this voltage. There is a filament current. These two things are shown. Then there is the angle, which Theta. This is angle made by X-ray tube with respect to sample surface, and the two theta is the twice of that angle, which is uh, X-ray tube with sample surface, or we can say that detector with sample surface and twice of that angle. Okay, so this information is given on this display. So now we give simple. Yes, as well as this. Yes, this two theta also. So it will both things will go up. Yes, so we can see that here.
Okay. So now we can see here. So we have started. Now you can see here. Okay, here I see the angle. Yes, here, here here you can see the angle is changing. You can you can show it here. The angles are changing, and the shutter is open. This is just five minutes scan. scan. We are scanning from ten degree to eighty degree. The Scan is only for five minutes, so we'll see if there is any peaks in this scan. So I will explain this in terms of that Bragg angle and other things in detail once the scan is over. Here my uh, source is moving theta degree, and my detector is making you theta from the, the from yes, that. from that angle. Yes. So both are like moving in the same same speed. Okay. Both will make angle theta with respect to sample surface, okay. and they will go up. Okay. Now so double of this this angle is two theta. So yeah, I can see now. Now they are moving. They are coming closer now. And you can see that the this LED which is on, which is indicating that the shutter of this uh, X-ray uh, after this tube, when the, uh, the tube is generating X-ray all the time, when we start this uh, diffractometer, the shutter will open. So okay. that will indicate that the shutter is opened, and you cannot open the machine or you cannot do anything now. Okay. So what are we expecting now? I am. Uh... Studying an amorphous material. Yes. So there are not fixed atomic arrangement in the in that amorphous material. Yes. So what do I expect? What what do I get? So suppose suppose you have some unknown powder and you want to know either what that made up of. Either it is crystalline or amorphous. If it's crystalline, what are the what are the uh, diffraction piece? Can we use that for some information? Now we can see I that. Can also say, uh, what is material? If it is crystalline, yes, can you I can. Yes, you are able to see what it, the material is, provided that you have known earlier within, like you are growing some particular material and you want to know within that. It is not that any new material that you can immediately because study. Because material is different. Yes. So every material, if you take, uh, it is the X-ray diffraction pattern for that is like a fingerprint. So from the fingerprint, the peaks which are appearing at particular two theta position, you will able to find out what the material is and this uh, crystal composition and other details. Where is data? Do we have to data collection somewhere? Some yes, there is a there is a big data collection which is called uh, JCPDS data file, which is near about one million. So ten lakh samples are already uh, data uh, database is made for this ten lakh sample. So your sample most probably will be with, within one of these uh, samples which are generated, which data is actually generated. So if you have any new data which is not within this database, so you have to upload that. If you have some some new material which is not already uh, exists, so then this data is you have to upload this data, so it will be added in the database as a new data. But some other method, I will have to know which method which material it is. Yes. Yes, so you'll have to compare that. You have to confirm that this is a new material and this database. So this database is actually uh, made this way only. Like people have added new materials and this database is uh, infringed. So now we can see here. So from the. So now my scan has reached the. From 10 to 80, 70 degree, and there are no like major peaks or any other things you see. You see only noise. There is a broad, there is a broad peak at 22, which is coming from the uh, either the sample holder or some impurity in this. Uh, when I crush this glass, so is this impurity is coming from that. So there are no major peak as such that we can describe. So we'll see now another sample, which is uh, which is crystalline sample. That is our common salt, and we compare that. With this NHCL, yes. So, which is we know that it is uh, 
which is uh, which is crystalline it is having a rock salt crystal structure okay. and we can compare we are using the powder and i will explain why we have to make it in a powder form so let this can be over and we can use okay so this one is over so now we load this nscl powder and see if we are getting any peaks or not and then we compare so this powder should be of the order of 10 micron after you like uh, make a powder grains yes it should be around 10 micron in order to get proper data no you will get data no problem even if it is finer you will get that yes same same thing to it so now why you have to make powder when we'll see this if we if we take this uh, if we take this now in order to form this diffraction this plane should be parallel so whatever the crystal uh, i will explain the planes and other things in detail but the diffraction powder diffraction will work if this planes are parallel to the surface so if we make a powder we are able to make all, most of the planes parallel to the sample surface and we can get data from most of the planes available in that crystal line okay we are randomizing that we are yes randomizing that by making powder and unless you make it powder you are not able to see all the peaks i will show you some example where the material material is layer and we can see only the peaks which are which planes are parallel to the sample surface but not other planes so meanwhile when this is going on i will explain you the technique yeah, yeah, how, how we generate planes? yes how these different planes yes what is happening is that yes so we need to go to so we can analyze this diffract, uh, diffracting planes by technique called bragg's law by formula called bragg's law the atoms now in the crystalline form these are arranged in a definite definite position so from they form a layer the atomic layer through which you can draw geometric planes so when these planes are these are, imaginary. Planes, these are imaginary planes these are just the geometrical planes there is uh, position of atom so you can represent represent the position of atoms by just referring to this plane and the separation of this plane that is d which is between uh, distance between this first layer and the second layer so this d if it is 2d sin theta is n lambda this is called bragg's law then there is a diffraction condition where the uh, constructive interference pattern of this two incoming x ray beam will meet and you will get the peak you will get the intensity maxima at the detector so when when the when we are changing the source and detector position what happens is, what happens is that now this 2d sin theta is n lambda n is the order we take it one lambda is the wavelength of this uh, diffractometer which is 0.154 nanometer for copper k alpha radiation now this d d is fixed because we have fixed the material 
at particular theta this relation will be valid and okay. will get the intensity okay. at the diffracted okay. field so we can see yes some peak at that position yes so we can use this bragg's law to explain where the peak is now this is more general picture of the diffractometer where there is a tube what we have seen there is a detector and this, these are moving in the opposite direction so the diffraction when the diffraction condition is satisfied we will get the peak now this omega which is shown which is uh, and which is equal to theta because we are using only symmetric part of diffraction okay now we'll see that if we are getting any peak or not there can we take some question yes so the question is apart from the size of the powder particles that when you mentioned that the sample has to be finely powdered yes Yes. So we have made that special holder. It should just up to the surface of that holder, so not more than that. Hundred like micron or so something that. like two hundred micron 200 around micron that. Yes. Layer. So uh, yes, it should match with the center of this uh, diffraction geometry. Oh, uh, uh, that that only when we this particular holder. Now, yeah, what if I'm I want to use some other holder? Then you will have to do the height height alignment because what happens is that. the diffraction condition will satisfy if the if it is if it is at too high then your diffraction condition will not satisfy because your 2 theta will be at different angle then you will have to do the height alignment i think the question is about the depth so the depth how thick a layer of the okay so not about the height alignment not about the height alignment okay the x ray can penetrate up to 10 micron thickness so it will go up to 10 micron Not more than that. So the only the layer is ten micron. Yes. So yes. So yes. X-ray will just see only the top ten micron part. So that is called penetration depth of X-ray. Yes. Secondly, uh, are there standards for sample that we can test as it is Yes. Standards like the manufacturer will give you mostly silicon standard, silicon one 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 as a standard. so you can just load that and check all peak positions are coming at proper 2 theta and intensity is correct so those kind of things also there is one question about how does one determine molecular structure using x ray uh, but i guess that uh, not at this time but no it will be somewhat uh, like you have to yeah. use that ritual analysis and other analysis but that is more statistical part that will so, take so, up today we are basically Yeah. I think now we can go and we check can that go and check that. Yeah. So. So can you see some peaks? I see peaks here. So can you see some peaks? From 10 to 80 degrees, so there are several peaks. Yes. So yes. So we can just from from NSL and we'll see. Yes. Suppose you bring NaCl powder and you want to confirm that the powder is either NaCl or there is some mixture. You run this pattern and that should be exactly give you peaks at this location. Okay. okay. Suppose you have mixed powder NaCl with something else. So what will happen that you will get these peaks as well as additional peaks. Okay. okay. So you can have many powders. You can get all peaks and you have to then analyze which peak is from which powder. Does the intensity of an IC differ? Differ? Uh, different intensity. Yes. Is it because of the randomness? No, no. The peak intensity will depend on something called atomic structure factor. We will not see that in more details here. But it will. It 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 is related to how these atoms are arranged in the particular crystal. So that will depend on uh, atomic structure factor. 
second thing is that it will depend on for multiplicity factor so like the 100 peak or 100 pace for qubit is having multiplicity more there are six faces like that it will depend on multiplicity factor it will depend on structure factor that we can we'll see it afterwards not in the today's session okay so, so we can remove the sample Can you see some change in the color? So initially it was not like that. Can we? So initially it was not like that. So this color change is because uh, this is called F center. This is uh, X-ray is ionizing radiation. NaCl when X-ray falls on that, if we keep it for longer time. the x-ray will generate ionize this nsr it will remove the electron and this electrons will get trapped in the uh, in, in in the crystal it will absorb the light and it will radiate it will radiate only that light which is uh, at the bandage so we see the brown color if we expose it for longer time we can clearly see the brown color so this brown color is from ionizing radiation it will last for like few minutes and again it will disappear so that ionization uh, whatever is happened it will go away so it will decay so this is called ionizing radiation in plus ncl minus ion formed in that yes ion form in that yes so this explains that x ray is ionizing radiation any radiation which is more than 8 kilo electron hole is ionizing radiation and which is harmful to like uh, biological cause so we all the plane you said all the plane scatter yes uh, so i will explain it yes right. so the planes extra intensity which we see in those peaks is proportional to this structure factor with some other other scalar factors which are initial intensity multiplicity factor and other things but mainly it will depend on the structure factor now this structure factor is given by this expression we need not go to this details of this expression but it depends on actually what happens is extra diffraction is the fourier transform transform of electron density so the electron density around the atom and around the when it forms a lattice it will give diffraction we will not go in go in details of that part but planes where this where this uh, lattice part is not making the constructor interference those planes will not get for example in this case the 1 1 1 plane which is along the diagonal of the cube that is having low intensity the 2 20 is having more intensity this is yeah. this is of which material are we this is from the nsl we can see that yes. peak as this uh, 32 degree 32 or degree. so then there is a peak at then there is a peak at uh, 45 degree so we can index all this peak for particular diffracting planes like hkl planes we okay. refer to now since we have made this powder we can see the different planes like 111 311 222 400 you can yes all these planes but if we have only layered mat material if we may don't make a powder layer material like a mica sheet then we can get only peak from this 006 008 0010 0012 those kind of thing so peak peak like 111 which will not appear in this thing. so that's why we have to make powder can modify layers material so now i know like i had powdered amorphous glass and uh, powdered nacl so this is yes. something i grow layer material something. yes layer material is like uh, for, for your transistor application you have gallium arsenide substrate on that you grow 
gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, this kind of material. So these are layer materials. There is a particular orientation like zero zero one on grow on some substrate. Yes. For example, this is a mica substrate. So mica substrate is along zero zero one direction. So you will get diffraction, powder diffraction from mica substrate. Like peaks will be of the order of zero zero L. That is zero zero six, zero zero eight, zero zero ten, like that. So you will not get peaks like random orientation, like three one one. Two 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 like that. Yes. Yeah. So here you, this is only three digits. Three digits. I can see here. I can see four. Here also I can see four. What is the difference no. between these three and four number representation? No, no. This is zero zero six. Now in this zero zero ten. This is actually zero zero ten. So this is cubic material. This is monoclinic. So this is uh, not having that hexagonal kind of indices. Okay. This is only three indices. Zero zero six. Zero zero ten zero zero sixteen that kind of oh, okay. yes this is monoclinic material yeah so now since we have seen this uh, X-ray diffraction for amorphous as well as crystalline sample diffraction is not from any amorphous material yeah, I I want to ask that from amorphous material I didn't get any tick so I don't I don't actually study amorphous material I can only know whether the material is amorphous, amorphous or not. Yes, we can use amorphous material X-ray for analyzing an amorphous material using technique called X-ray reflectivity. Here you see the reflectivity from uh, from the visible light, where you see the mountain and its image in the lake because of the reflection. This is a visible light reflection. Okay. Now in the X-ray region, it is somewhat different. Now what happens is that if you take a fiber optic where light is entering at one end, when it the angle of entry uh, incidence. Is less than something called critical angle. This beam will pass through the fiber, even if it yes. is if, if you bend the fiber, it it will go. This is called total internal reflection. Similarly, if you take X-ray, now refractive index of X-ray for the material at is less than one. So what happens is that up to the critical angle, there is a property called okay, refractive index of a material with the X-ray. Is less than one. Is Usually, than one, no? it is greater than one for okay. visible for yes for dense material for visible light. But at X-ray, this uh, refractive index is less than one, and we use this property of uh, refractive index which is less than one to analyze uh, like samples, amorphous sample using technique called total external reflection. So what happens is that up to the if the incident beam is low. Less than that critical angle, uh -huh. the X-ray will not penetrate through the material, but it will get reflected okay. back. Yes, okay. when it reach at the critical angle, they will start penetrating. If your layered material and the substrate now has different densities, so it, what happens is that the X-ray will get reflected. There is the interference, and you will get some fringes from the reflectivity. So goal is this angle. Critical angle is very small. For gold, it is like 0.7 degree, and for silicon, it is only 0.22 degree. So this angle is very small, but we can use it to analyze all the amorphous material as well as crystalline material by using X-ray reflectivity. So we see that X-ray reflectivity can give you information like critical angle where the intensity. Which material I am studying here? In this case, there is a. This is just substrate and film. So. Substrate and film ha having different density, material density. Yes. We'll show. I will show you one example, okay. and then we can we can check. This is a general example. So it will give information. What is the density of this material? Okay. Then what is the thickness of this material? And what is the surface roughness? So these three information you can get from the extra reflectivity, and we'll see this with one example. For example, here on silicon, we have grown aluminium oxide. Which is around 20 nanometer by ALD atomic layer deposition, and you can see there are fringes which will give you thickness. So, like there are fringes at. So this is the place where it will the X-ray intensity will start reducing. That is the critical angle. 
this fringes the position uh, separation of the fringes will give you the thickness we can use this uh, fourier trans fast fourier transform method or any uh, simple analytical method to calculate the thickness uh, or we can just write simulation program and get the thickness the rule of thumb is that you take 0 to 5 degree this two theta scan see how much peaks are there and just multiply by 2 so you will get the thickness now we'll check one example and see we can measure the thickness another property okay so now we'll move to the another diffractometer Now we'll move to the another diffractometer. This is okay. This is another diffractometer which is very similar, like we have seen earlier. There is a rotating anode now which is giving more flux of X-ray than as compared to our X-ray tube. This is a sample holder and there is a detector. So very similar arrangement like we have seen. We have mounted one sample which is aluminum hafnium oxide. Amorphous layer grown on uh, silicon 111 by ALD Technics. This is amorphous material, and we'll see how we can check with uh, its thickness by using this method. So in this case, we'll see how the sprays are getting reflected from this. Now you you can see there the angle of incidence oh. is very small, yeah. which is around like one degree or so. Oh. It is coming on the sample now up to the critical angle. Up to the critical angle, the intensity is maximum. After oh. that, it starts falling down, and you will see some fringes coming from the sample. Oh. What if my amorphous material is not a layer? It's just a piece of glass kind of thing. Bulk. If the density is different than the substrate, then you will be able to see the fringes. If there is no substrate, I want to see the fringes. You need a different density between two things. Whatever you have grown, this uh, amorphous material is used for like Gate, uh, gate electrode of the transistor and other uh, other most of the applications, uh, sensor applications and other places where you need amorphous material and you need to know what is the thickness of this amorphous material, its density and the inter, yes, yeah, uh, the critical angle will give the density. You can measure the thickness by the fringes. You know the interface roughness as well as surface roughness by this decay in the intensity. Okay, so only layered uh, amorphous materials. I only layered amorphous material you you can study by X-ray reflectivity. And why not? Can why not using the amorphous powder XRD? Can I not use that? Can I do the same experiment there? No, in uh, the powder X-ray diffraction, your optics is different. You set diffractometer. The focusing technique is called bragg brenton focusing, where your sample and detector, they will detect the part around the, the optics which is beam is coming, which is focused properly. So you will get more information from the sample. In order to do the reflectivity, your beam condition 
conditioning is different you have to your incident beam is at very low angle and your detector so it is again very sim similar geometry there it is called theta to theta geometry but your sample alignment should be very perfect that alignment we don't do in there except the height we don't have to do there so that is the difference the optics is different in extra reflectivity which is very precise the alignment of the sample normal alignment i have done it before which is very precise if there is a slight misalignment of the normal to the sample you will not get the reflectivity fringes this problem is not there for powder sample because there is no need of that alignment yes only height alignment is necessary now we can see that fringes yes so initially it, it has done pre scan where it check all the things are correct or not now it is doing long scan so from the scan we can see that there is a critical angle which is around uh, 2 theta is uh, 0.7 so 0.35 degree then there are fringes okay so these fringes are if you count 1 2 3 4 5 6. so from 0 to 5 degree the number of fringes you multiply by 2 you will get the thickness and we will check that with fft also there is a software which will take this scan it will do fast fourier transform and give us the approximate thickness so that technique we can use and we can get the information of the thickness very quickly you don't have to do like uh, cross section or any other thing this is non destructive method you will immediately get the thickness within like uh, 20 minutes so i have to use some ha huh, you there is a software which is already having that formula it will take this thing it will do the fast fourier transform of this data and then give you the thickness you can also like uh, like your own formula you can write this is the exponential thing which is uh, periodic so like something like uh, sine function so you can write your own formula also which is not very difficult so what information it gives we can check in the Uh, effect of light yes light so yes so what information it gives suppose your density is different then what happens whole density is very large so your critical angle is large silicon dioxide density is less so your critical angle is very low so from this critical angle you can calculate the density now suppose you grow some thin film and you want to know either it is porous or it is non porous so you do the x ray reflectivity get the critical angle if your critical angle is slightly different than what is the idea of critical angle you subtract that and you will get the percentage porosity so that porosity is used for sensor applications they need particular porosity because it has to absorb gas and other thing so sensor you have to Uh, no what is the porosity of the thin film okay. effect of density that will change the critical angle effect of thickness suppose you have 5 nanometer thick layer like this is gold 5 nanometer thick on silicon so the number of fringes are like less so these fringes are separated with uh, more angle if you increase the thickness this example gives like 20 nanometer uh, film thickness now these fringes are very close so what happen if i take thickness which is like 100 nanometer can i measure any thickness with x ray reflectivity no because yeah. this resolution will not get so if if i have up to 100 nanometer i can get this resolution number of fringes will be very close to each other and if it is more than 100 nanometer i will not able to resolve two fringes then i cannot calculate the thickness so between 5 nanometer to say 100 nanometer is the limit for x ray reflectivity x ray reflectivity can be from ano amorphous material can be single crystal material as well so you can this technique is not depend on the diffraction technique as such but condition is that the density must be different your your sample substrate and the layer if their density difference is not more you will not able to do measure it the other next effect is that surface roughness if your surface is very rough okay, uh, there is a small but important question yes uh, said that for x rays the refractive index is less than 1 yes 
So there is a question: Does this mean that the light is faster than day to day respect to the city? No. That limit is always there. This uh, uh, refract index is less. It is only that group velocity is more, not the actual velocity. Yes. So light velocity is the maximum. That is the limit. That we are not talking. Yes. That we are not talking. And secondly, uh, are the X rays that we are using are they coherent? They are coherent. Yes. They are coherent, monochromatic. That is uh, weird. So, if the roughness is more, suppose you have very rough sample, then you are not able to get uh, intense. This intensity, the fringe intensity amplitude, depends on roughness. Suppose your roughness is very high, then even after like uh, your density is different, your thickness is within the limit, but you will not able to see any fringes as such. For example, in this sample, in this uh, sketch. You see the interface roughness is only 0.5 nanometer. You see the proper fringes. When the roughness is 2 nanometer, you are not able to see any fringes. So you are not able to use uh, this for calculating any uh, thickness. So this machine can be used for advanced measurements also. Like we have seen only two applications, like uh, powder diffraction and the reflectivity. But this particular machine we can use for more advanced technique called pole figure, uh, stress analysis of the thin film, then uh, reciprocal space mapping and other things. In which case you have to align particular particular reflection by rotating the sample or by inclining this sample at different angle. So that uh, will not able to see in this present talk. We can see it afterwards. But this machine is able to do all this measurement by different techniques. Okay. So we are, we are not covering in other details. So there are other possibilities by using this machine for different techniques and we will not see that. So here we can So we will see how we measure the thickness by FFT here. Just one minute. It's getting over. Now we are using software to So this is the measurement just to have performed. Now we will able to measure this thickness by fitting. Oh, something just some problem. I will open that.
some problem with the program. Okay, I will just correct you. Okay, there is some problem with the program. So I will not calculate by using that now, but this is the reflectivity technique and we can stop here. Thank you, Maheshi, for explaining. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can we take some more questions? Yeah. So there is a uh, question. What is the measure difference between spectra and materials and difference between the two? Yes. So amorphous material will not give you any diffraction peak as such because there is no definite atomic arrangement. The single crystal material will give us different peaks depending upon its specific. Like what is crystal it is made up of out of that seven families. Yes. So, so there will be definite peaks in the. Now, now there is a slightly in-depth question. Uh, we do, we, basically, an amorphous material we can't really discuss about crystal in plane. Yes. It is amorphous. Yes. So in that case, how does one use X ray spectroscopy for uh, understanding that such material? We can use reflectivity for analyzing that, either it is layered or not. But apart from that, there is some some ordering in an amorphous material also, but we need to analyze that like this is not in within the our scope of this. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, somebody is asking like the reflectivity technique is used words like scattering, reflection and diffraction. Yes. So some person is finding it bit confusing, like, yeah. uh, like there, there, like uh, are the terms really interchangeable, or we are talking about different phenomena? This, uh, these things are like the diffraction is the scattering itself. It is like particular case of the scattering. The reflection, what we are talking about, is the diffracted intensity from the X-ray from the sample that we are talking about the reflection. So that is the thing. So this is particular scattering is the main technique. And these are the particular things of that. All right. So there are no questions now. So I think it is uh, time to thank the speakers for presenters for their time and effort. And uh, now for announcing the next uh, session. Uh, on first Sunday of January, we'll be back at Tripoli Theater and. Professor Basudev Das Gupta will talk about chance theta. It's about probability, fundamentals of probability, and applications of probability in different branches of science. So, stay stay tuned. Next Sunday, 11 o'clock, we'll be at Prithvi Theatre. Till then, bye bye. Thank you. Bye.